Good morning. Welcome <laughs> to our Caribbean and African Targeted Health Improvement Program, CAFI Health Hour. The Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating and giving space to black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members such as pharmacists, specialist nurses and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences and ask questions to our black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. Good morning everybody it's lovely to see you all on the Saturday morning and uh, I'm personally I'm pleased to be back I, I haven't done this for the last five months because I've been away um, but it, I'm delighted to be back and hosting um, a really really important health hour. Uh, today we'll be talking about breast cancer um, in black women and the journey that some people can go on. And in line with what we've discussed before, we will have somebody who's actually been through that journey, a patient advocate, who will be talking to us and telling us about how she, her personal experience, which I think is really important because it brings to life why we're here. So I'm also delighted to welcome uh, Miss Georgette Oni, who's a consultant in Nottingham, who was really has, um, uh, who's joining us today to give tell us about breast cancer. Um, Thank you so much for Georgette for, for um, joining us and without much further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Sorry. I did I've got that again because I was talking to myself. <laughs> so I'd like to say thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, it really is a pleasure. I think your initiative is amazing. And, it, you know, the topics that you cover, the range that you cover it is truly fantastic. Um, so thank you once again for inviting me to speak. Uh, and obviously it's quite poignant because this is the very first day of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, so very topical. Um, a little bit about myself. So I'm actually a trained plastic surgeon. Um, and through my training, um, it's like many things, you're at med school and you think a lot of things don't apply to you because a lot of what you see is related to white people or, you know, I've, I trained in Leicester, so Asian um, community as well. And so it became apparent to me as I was training, I was beginning to hear about friends uh, and family who were developing breast cancer. And I was always going to do breast reconstruction and I wanted to find out more about breast cancer. Um, and then I ended up doing more training in actually being able to deliver breast cancer work as well as the reconstructive work. So my NHS practice is now exclusively breast and breast cancer work. As, uh, so I do the um, cancer resection as well as the reconstruction. Um, and I'm based at Nottingham um, in the Breast Institute uh, in Nottingham. Uh, and one of the other things that I've done, which is, you know, which I found really quite fulfilling is I've also become a trustee for Breast Cancer Now, which is one of the major breast cancer uh, charities in the country. 
So why are we talking about breast cancer? It, it's extremely common. Uh, it's very common indeed. We used to say it's probably one in eight women that will get breast cancer in their lifetime, probably approaching one in seven now. So most of you will probably know someone who, who at least knows someone that has had breast cancer. It that. The, uh, the reason I like to show this graph actually is because it, it does demonstrate something, which it demonstrates that although the incidence of breast cancer is going up and up and up, people passing away or dying from breast cancer is actually decreasing. So what that means is we're getting very, very good at treating breast cancer. And so for the vast majority of women who get this diagnosis, they're going to be cured and move on uh, past that diagnosis. Um, and but the issue that I found, though, is that that is not the case if you look, if you actually drill it down and start to look at different ethnic groups. And that's how I got very interested in this, is that when you look at it, black women actually have a higher mortality from breast cancer. So that means they're more likely to die from their breast cancer than their white counterparts. But I think for, the, for me, the take home slide from this is we're getting very, very good at treating breast cancer. So what is it? Well, it's basically just abnormal cells, okay, that grow within the breast. And the breast is made up of glandular tissue, it's made up of fatty tissue, it's got the lobules, it's got the ducts, and there's different types of cancers which arise from those different areas. The vast majority come through the ducts, okay, and then a, a smaller percentage uh, through the lobules. Um, there's lots and lots of different types of breast cancer. Um, and part of the reason why we're getting better and better at treating it is because we really are starting to personalize the way in which we treat cancer. So in days gone by, everybody got the same treatment. Everybody got a uh, mastectomy. Everybody got all their glands cleared away. Everybody got chemotherapy. Everybody got radiotherapy. That is not the case today. We're very targeted in the way that we treat it. So we drill down what are the features of your breast cancer and we target the treatments it, 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 relevant, relevant to that. So it's quite important to understand what is our risk of getting this. We, so thankfully, actually, as black women, we're more, and men can get this as well, although the, the risk is lower. So we say about one in a thousand for men, but men can get breast cancer because they do have breast tissue. The risks for breast cancer, these are things that we, we can potentially modify. So there's some risk factors which we cannot modify. So the, the big ones we can't modify are basically being female and getting older. Those are the two major risk factors for developing a breast cancer. Nothing we can do about that. But there are other things that we can can do. So the things that we can't do anything about, I've talked about being female, getting older, unfortunately, breast density. We know that if you've got increased density, you've got an increased risk. And part of um, some of the newer things that they're developing is can we look at breast density and, and grade your risk on relation to that? Family history, really important that we start talking amongst our families. You know, what did um, you know, grandma so-and-so pass away from? What did your, my aunt die away from? So that you know, is there a family history, not just of breast, but of ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer? These are all things which all come under a, a, an umbrella of different genes, which can predispose you to developing a, a breast cancer. And there are lots of genes that are involved, actually. The main ones we talk about are BRCA1 and BRCA2 and increasingly PAL-B2, but there are lots of other genes that are implicated in cancer diagnosis. Ionizing radiation, not so much these days, but it used to be a treatment um, for, for different conditions uh, where you would get like a, essentially a whole body radiation. And we are thankfully seeing less and less coming through, but there were, there were patients that were getting breast cancer as a, as a relation to treatment for other diseases. And then there are some what we call um, sort of precursor lesions. So these are lesions which you find in the breast. They're not actually cancers, but by definition of the fact that you've had them, you're at increased risk of developing a cancer later on in life. And obviously having had one cancer, it does increase your risk of, of, of others. And then there are other, there are other conditions. So um, medical, so diabetes is one. Um, we're not really quite sure why the link is there, but obviously if you are a diabetic, having good diabetic control um, is helpful in reducing your risk. Um, and the vast majority of breast cancers are driven by estrogen which is basically what we call the female hormone. So things that increase or decrease that estrogen level can affect your risk, your, your, your risk profile. So starting your periods early and ending them late, okay, means that you've got a longer period of time in which you're having estrogen pumping through your body and therefore can increase your risk. But also treatments we give. So, you know, at the moment, there's a lot of controversy around menopause and the menopause treatments, but HRTs, contraceptive pills, these all contain estrogen. And so there's relatively 
relative risks involved. And at the moment, that's quite a controversial topic. Uh, breastfeeding, again, why? Because it actually, um, the more children you have and the more that you breastfeed, again, it reduces the amount of overall exposure to estrogen. I'm not recommending you go out and have loads of children to breastfeed them all, but it's understanding um, how, how it all feeds into each other. So things that we can modify. So we know that being overweight increases the risk of breast cancer. So if you can get your weight into a good into a good range and keep it there, be stable, this is a good thing. Exercise. There was a recent study, just I think it was last month, that came out showing that just a you know moderate amount of exercise a week, this can help reduce your risk. Alcohol. Um, keeping within those limits. Okay. So, you know, if you're having a unit a day or, you know, is perfectly acceptable, but if you're having 21, 26, you know, 30, 40 units a week, and everyone's quite stressed right now, uh, these things can introduce, can increase your risk of cancer. And we, we talked about estrogen exposure already. Um, what I will say is if you look at those top three, they're pretty much implicated in just about every disease that we have, okay? So this doesn't just reduce your risk, your breast cancer risk, it reduces your risk of things across the board. So heart problems, blood pressure problems, uh, diabetes problems, stroke, all of these things reduce those risks for you. So it, it's basically a win-win if you, if you can, you, if you can uh, modify those risk factors. So if you look specifically at um, how we diagnose cancers, there, there are basically the breast cancers. There are basically two routes through which our patients come. They either come through screening, and some of you may have been on one of these vans where you climb up and you get your mammogram done, or they feel something or sense something in the breast and they present that way, which is what we call the symptomatic route for assessment. So what is screening? Well, screening is essentially, it's like having an x-ray taken of the breast. So there is, a, the, it, it, it is an annual, we have a national screening program uh, in this country, okay? And it's between the ages of 50 and 74 at the moment, but they are, they are looking at extending that. Um, and essentially every three years, you will be called for a mammogram. And they estimate that it saves about 1300 lives a, a year in, in for, you know, for, so basically one for every 200 women screened. And it's, it's expensive, but but it, you know, it's free and it's there. So every three years you're going to be called up, okay, for a mammogram. And by and large, for most people, you come, you have your mammogram, you go, and that is the end of that. But there is a small proportion who basically get recalled for something, okay, and may need assessment. Um, and an even smaller proportion of those will then go on to have a cancer. So that's 1% of like all women having, you know, screening. The benefits of screening are that, um, you can pick up disease early and picking up disease early translates to a higher, um, uh, so you're more likely to be cured of your disease if you can pick it up in an earlier stage, essentially. But a lot of people don't like mammograms, okay? Uh, because it is uncomfortable and I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm not yet, but soon I think in the screening uh, age, but it is uncomfortable, patients do tell me that. And what I say is, you know, it is one in three years, so one every three years. Um, so for, for those brief moments where it has to occur, it potentially could save your life. The other thing that people mention about mammograms is radiation and radiation exposure. exposure. Yes, there is radiation exposure, but uh, one of the things I say to patients is, if I offered you a free trip to New York, all expenses paid, would you go? Um, if I did that once every three years, and the answer is usually, yeah, of course I'd go. Well, you get less radiation exposure having a mammogram than you would fly, flying to New York. And this is my area, Nottingham, and this was the screening uptake over the last few years. And as you can see, there is a huge drop off um, through COVID. There was a huge drop off in women coming for screening. We like, I think it's something around 72%, 75% we, of women, we would like to attend their screening. And Nottingham just sort of kind of dips under the, the, the average for England. But in COVID, it's really just really, really dropped off. So and if we look at your area, I think most of you are up in the Manchester area. So I've got the figures from Manchester and you can see again same it's always been under the national average so it's always just ticking along below and again dropped off so this is basically a plea uh, for people that when you get called up for the screening the invitation please attend it potentially could save save a life just for those brief moments of discomfort it could potentially save a life um and there's we know that black women or women from ethnic minorities they are less likely to attend their screening um, than their white counterparts 
And so I've just mentioned about COVID and the fact that it um, was a catalyst for many things, actually. It's been obviously a very, very hard time for a lot of people. And what it has done is it's shown, shone a really bright light on the fact that there are lots of disparities in healthcare. It's not just around cancer care, it's like many, many facets of healthcare. Um, and a lot of that was highlighted because we saw that disproportionately, you know, people from non-white backgrounds were, 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 were either, you know, on the front line, were dying from COVID in, in, an, in a rate that exceeded, um, you know, their white counterparts. So it's really shone a light in, on inequalities. And I, it is one of my interests, and I've written some papers related to that. And we've seen that women from ethnic backgrounds are least likely to attend their screening programmes. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, some of it is related to cultural beliefs. Some of it is related to just lack of understanding uh, about what it means to be in a screening programme. And some of it is related to just not relating. So they just don't think it applies to them because they're not seeing people that look like them, you know, on brochures that are handed out um, in educational people pieces that come that go out it, it, it just doesn't resonate with them so you know from these studies we know that it, it's it needs to be targeted appropriate we need to understand the audience in which we're targeting to and that's why programs like this this whole series is fantastic because it is about targeting a community to say well look you know you know we you've got healthcare workers who are you know working really hard to improve the health of the nation let's get everybody up to the same to the same standard it's about access one of the things that came out is that you know there are lots of factors including logistics as to how people engage with healthcare. At the end of the day, we live in a society where healthcare is free at the point of entry, and yet we still have disparities. So there's got to be other things that's going on, which is stopping people from engaging in healthcare. And then there's cultural cultural issues. So there's lots of issues around body images, about faith, about the you know community values. And I think these are things that you know the the more of us that get involved in delivery of healthcare is the more that the knowledge of the cultural nuances can become embedded in the way services are delivered. So as I said, two main routes. So that's screening. Um, the other route is symptomatic. Okay, and one of the things I again harp on about is for us to know our breasts. Why? Well, actually, if you look at the figures, um, black women are more likely to present under the age of 50. So that means that you're not in the screening age. Right. So if you find something, it's because you picked it up and you went to the doctor to say, look, something's not right with my breast. So you need to know what's what's normal for you to be able to know, therefore, what is abnormal. And I've got a little um, video here. I'll let I'll let it play. Um, I might might stop it because we don't just because of time, but it's quite a nice um, video about how to examine yourself. So I'm going to let that play. Okay. Hopefully it's going to work. Just let me know if you can hear the sound. So the first thing to do is realise that breasts are lumpy bumpy and they're very individual to each person. First thing to do is relax. It's actually not that hard to be breast aware. Most of our patients who come and see us in the clinic have found a breast cancer by accident. It's not that subtle, it's easier than you think. You will notice if there are any changes to your breast. Best thing to do is to do this when you're in the shower or the bath. And if you're thinking about grabbing that sponge to wash your breasts, just don't. Get rid of the sponge. Just lather up your hands and use your bare hands and wash those breasts and under your arms. Take a look in the mirror and have a look at how they look. Raise your arms in the air, turn side to side and just get to know how normal looks for you. Don't go looking for lumps. Now, this might sound strange, but normal breast tissue is very lumpy. We have lots of fat lobules. We have milk lobules. We have ductal tissue. We have supportive tissue. We have lymph nodes. And all of these feel like little lumps and bumps in your breasts. And that's completely normal. Now, some women have very fatty breasts. Some women have very dense glandular tissue. Again, very normal. So what you need to be looking for are changes. And don't panic. You notice something. Just don't panic. OK, have a feel and monitor that. So below is a, a pie chart. This shows you the amount of patients we have in the clinic. The little blue area, that's the amount of patients that actually come to us with actual cancer. The OK, so there are. Yeah. So there are lots of normal breasts that feel very, very lumpy. And so specific things that might suggest that, that 
that you need to present and have investigated are changing the breast. So if you feel a firm, hard lump, okay, that's getting bigger, it's not going away, and it's very different to the other side. Normally breasts are fairly symmetrical. So if you feel a lump on one side and you feel it on the other, then the likelihood is that it's glandular tissue. It's very rare to get cancers in both breasts. But if you feel a lump in one breast, it's quite firm um, and is, is not going away, then present, definitely present to, to the doctor. Changes in the skin, so dimpling, redness, um, so there's a there's a change which looks like sort of like orange peel. It's called podorange. So if you see that, then then that needs to be investigated. Changes in your nipple. So if you've got rash of the nipple, discharge from the nipple, the nipple being pulled in, these are all things to look for. If you feel any lumps in the armpit, those need to be investigated. It is not unusual to get changes with um, periods. So your breast can become firmer that you may feel they're lumpy during your period. But if you've gone through one or two cycles and it's still there it's worth just getting it investigated. And so, as you can see, again, you, you know, we can see the effects of COVID, that big dip, okay, this is patients coming to see us, that big dip was during the lockdowns, basically. So we, you know, a lot of patients didn't come because that's what they were being told, stay home, protect lives. Um, but it meant that we get this rebound where the numbers are going up and up and up. And, and, and that in itself is not a bad thing. We would rather people came and be checked out and be fine than have cancers and sit at home and I've had patients coming to clinic two years down the line who said look I've had this lump for two years but because um I didn't want to come into hospital because I was concerned um, about COVID I didn't come into hospital so I think it's actually very important that if you think that there's something wrong still seek prompt medical uh, attend uh, medical advice go to the GP and if the GP thinks it's necessary they will refer you up to a breast unit for assessment and as you can see, actually, we don't, uh, most patients that come through that door are not going to have a cancer. They're not going to have something that we need to investigate. There was a bit of a peak. Um, our conversion rate is usually about 7%. So for 100 patients that come through our door, only seven will actually have, have a cancer. So we do. So this is not in figures, by the way. We treat a lot of cancers. So it's approaching a thousand, a thousand cancers um, a year. But actually for that, we're seeing about seven and a half, eight thousand patients. So again, very low numbers are actually being converted in, into cancers. And this, I've, I've put this in here because there's lots of myths and things around what causes breast cancers and what doesn't. And we, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a um, annual event that I that I run. And one of the, the um, it, it's an annual conference. And one of the things that we have is a whole session just around myth busting, because there's lots of um, things that that are said that are, that are simply not true in relation in relation to breast and bre developing a breast cancer and treatment of breast cancer. Um, and it's not helpful to us because if we are not able to pick up these issues early, engage with the treatments that can help save us, then this, these are parts of the reason, it's not all of the reason, but part of the reason why we may not do so well in terms of survival. So the main ones that come through is it's, it's not a black disease. It's something that just affects white women and it really only affects the old. And I think what we've shown is that that's, this is not the case. It is true that we don't get it as much. Black women do not get it as, as much. The incidence is not as high. But when we get it, we get it younger. So this basically shows that the average age of getting breast cancer in this country is 62. For black women, that's 50. And it is the youngest okay, out of all of the groups. Right. Uh, but the numbers are low. Um, but we do get it. Um, the other thing is when we get it, we really get it, okay? So we get it at worst stage, as in, so that's gonna be worst grade. Um, we're going to get it with lymph node involvement. So these are all things which basically ramp up your risk of not doing as well if you've got that diagnosis. So the red bars basically mean a bit worse. And as you can see, when it comes to black women, the red bars for every one of those, you know, pointers is is more for black women so if we get it we really really do get it and to be honest we're not really sure why I mean there's lots of reasons I mean it, it is going to be multifactorial and we've we've covered quite a lot of them but but the, the fact of the matter is there simply has not been enough research done in this area for us to categorically say this is the reason why black women are doing worse um, and we know that, you know, that, that there are things that can, that, that media influences us quite heavily. Um, and so that's why there's a big push now um, for us to be represented in media, represented in educational literature, so that um, we don't feel that these things just don't apply to us.
So we've, you know, I've always had a bit of a more prompt approach to many things. And I, I do when it comes to breast education health, I do a lot of like community like um, events. So, you know, this is one for a Gambian society that we did in Nottingham. And I drag my nurses along and we bring our mannequins and we teach people how to examine our breasts. And we just get people kind of, you know, knowing that we are there, that we exist and that we're friendly. We're, you know, <laughs> come and see us if you've got a problem. Engage with your, you know, your screening and your mammogram. So we spend a lot of time. This The, the, the second picture is from when we went to an event at a mosque and we do talks at local groups so similar to this giving talks to local groups talk about you know some of the treatments about the role of family history genetics and about surgery because again there's lots of you know I, I mean I'm a surgeon and you know there's a lot you know most patients that come through my door when they hear the diagnosis of, of breast cancer there's two things they think will happen to them one is that they're going to have chemotherapy and lose their hair and the second is that they're going to have to lose their breasts 80% of women do not have a mastectomy, well, at least in my unit. In the country, it's about 60 to 70% of women will not have a mastectomy as their, their surgical procedure because of their breast cancer. And actually, the majority of women do not have chemotherapy either. So that's what I said about targeted treatment. We don't just chuck everything at everybody. We look at the features of your disease and we give you the appropriate treatment so that you can have the best outcome. On a national level, and this is something that I'm very proud of, this is the Let's Talk, Let's Talk About Black Women and Breast Cancer annual conference that we run. This was the first year in 2019 that was done at King's College campus. And a lot of these are actually medical students that helped me um, run that conference along with some of the healthcare professionals. It's very difficult to tell who's who because we all look very young. Um, but, you know, it was a great day and we had like, lots of talks. We had workshops. We taught people how to examine their breasts. You know, we talked about cancer treatments. We did, like we said, the myth busting. And it was really... And it's also it's for healthcare professionals as well as for the public. Why is that important? Because we know that ethnic, you know, pe people from a non-white background, sometimes the relationships that they have with healthcare healthcare providers are are not optimal essentially and that can be on the point and the point of the healthcare provider it could be on the the, the the you know on the um part of the patient or the public trying to engage and so it's very important that we have this two-way relationship and as healthcare professionals we need to understand the nuances of the, the the communities that we are trying to serve so the purpose of this conference is to get everybody into one space so that we learn from each other I do a lot of things on a national level. So, you know, I've been in podcasts. I'm currently in a in an exhibition at the Crick Institute down at, in, in London, which talks about cancer and the way cancer spread. Um, I've done lots of podcasts for the Royal College of Surgeons as well. I do lots of panels where we talk about inequalities in health. And I've got, you know, several of those coming up for the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I've mentioned that I'm a trustee um, for Breast Cancer Now. One of the reasons I wanted to do that was because, it, it you know, it's really imperative. Their, their motto is they want everyone to live well with cancer by 2050 that's everyone right so that includes black women and so it's very important that they get represented in the literature that the charity puts out the research that the charity does because research is a real issue there are not enough ethnic minority participants in trials so the data we assume it applies to them but we don't know because we don't have enough people enrolling in trials to really know whether these treatments are effective okay and whether that is part of the contributory uh, part of the con part of the reasons in which black women don't do as well so it's really important that we start talking about research and engaging in clinical trials I've even been abroad. I've been to Nigeria. I've done health awareness. This was part of things, of some activities we were doing for my dad's 70th um, birthday. This is his uh, village in Nigeria. We did lots of health talks and I ran a, a, a breast clinic uh, where I, again, taught women how to examine their breasts and examine them. Um, and that's my brother, my father um, flanking me on either side. So we do done a, a lot of things to try and raise awareness. And I've, I've just harped on about research. That's my absolute bugbear research. Um, so I bring you back to this because it's quite important to, to know we are getting very, very close to breast cancer. We are, okay? But we know that black women are lagging behind. And so it's really important that we educate ourselves about what our risk factors are. It's important that healthcare professionals understand that, you know, if a you know 30 something year old black woman goes and says, I've got a lump in the breast, you don't send them away and go, mm, you're too young for cancer. They might not be. Yeah, they need to go for proper assessment. So it's about understanding the nuances of the community that you're serving. So the next bit of the talk is actually about breast cancer management. But I'm actually quite aware that we're kind of half an hour in. Um, and I don't know whether it's a good place to stop now. I'm, I'm happy to come back and do like another, 
you know session on on breast cancer management this was talking more about like the um you know surgery and about the treatments that we use for breast cancer management but if you think this is a good place to stop um we could stop here um thanks Judette we've had some questions already in the chat about treatments so um it might I be I an idea to just, yeah okay so and we'll okay. come back and do a, a longer session because I think you're going to be a regular participant <laughs> I mean, if I, I can, I mean, I can briefly talk about the management. Okay, so this, this is, you know, it, it's, it is quite complicated now. Breast cancer management is is really complicated now, and and that's for because of what I was saying about tailoring treatment. So broadly speaking, though, there's four ways we treat breast cancer. There's radiotherapy, there's surgery, there's chemotherapies, and there's tablet therapies, right? And under chemotherapies, I actually call it now sort of circulating or systemic treatments because there's a lot of different types and they're not all chemotherapy in the traditional sense of chemotherapy most women if not you know 99.99 percent women they're going to have some form of surgery as part of their their treatment um and about 70 percent of women are sensitive to the tablet therapies depending on what kind of surgery you have and whether you have um lymph nodes involved or not will depend whether or not you have radiotherapy and similarly chemotherapy so most women will have surgery and tablet therapies um but there'll be a proportion that also need to have uh, radiotherapy and chemotherapy um, and in terms of surgery so I've got a bit about surgery because that's you know what I love doing um, but like I said most women are going to have a lumpectomy so about 70% of women are going to have a lumpectomy and about 30% of women will have a mastectomy with or without reconstruction and actually lumpectomies now have become more sophisticated and you might have a lumpectomy but you might have like a partial reconstruction technique with your lumpectomy so like I said I do both so for instance, these are women who have had lumpectomies, but they've had them done as part of a breast reduction operation, okay? So for all intents and purposes, you cannot tell that this woman's had cancer. She just looks like she had big breasts and she had them reduced. And so this is by far the most commonest technique that I use um, for taking out cancers. Um, you can also use bits of their tissue. So this woman had some tissue taken from her side. From the front on, you cannot tell that she's had a cancer. It's when she turns to the side, you can see that she's had a she's had an operation um and then we can use implants and so this woman has got an expander in which you can just see there um and then we'll use fluid um which is just there. she'll have a little bit of fluid to blow up the breast and then when it gets hello okay. so then they'll use fluid to inflate that and then we'll change that out for permanent implants um and then using your own tissue, which is the main, which is the, the one I love the most. And that's basically taking bits of tissue from other parts of the body and reconstructing your breast that way. And we know that black women, again, are, are less likely to undertake a form of reconstruction. So there's work to be done around why that's the case. Um, and so this is someone who's had the tissue from their tummy used to re re reconstruct their breast. And as you can see, the only bit that you can tell is that little patch there, which came from their tummy. So... Yeah, so these are the non-surgical type therapies which we've talked about, which are tablets, chemotherapy, radiotherapy. And, it, you know, it's that, it's that combination that's really going to give you the best outcome. So it's very tailored now. I think I'll probably, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Jajet. Um, In keeping with what we, we talked about at the beginning, we do have somebody who's here today called Rose, who's going to share her story with us. Rose, are you here? I am here, yes. Oh, thank you. Um, you you go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Oni, for what you shared, because most of it resonates with me. And um, my cancer journey started in 2020, 2021, around March. That's when I discovered that I had a little lump in my left breast. And... Um, I didn't even think of it as anything because I've, I've only been to hospital to have my three children and that's it. I'm, I'm never ill. Um, I mean, what, well, how could it be? So I just went very confidently and then I was told it was breast cancer. So my diagnosis was um, grade two invasive ductal cancer. and just the language, just the language alone kind of threw me 
I think of myself as a very confident person and I run a charity myself. So for the last 19 years, I run a charity called Support and Action for Women's Network. And I also work, uh, I'm, a, I'm part of a partnership where there's 10 organizations that support women. So for me, for me to be, to be thrown back by that diagnosis, it's not an easy thing. Because like, like uh, I've just been listening to what you've been saying, you think of one thing, oh my God, this is it. I'm going to die. I'm going to lose my breast, chemotherapy. And oh, so many things go through your head. But uh, the good thing is I kind of decided to remain very positive. And not just me, because first of all, I'm a Christian. So I, just, I was just thinking, I mean, this is, in, this is not it, God. You're looking out for me. So that was, the, that was my first uh, take on things. So results being what they are, it was during the lockdown. So very, very hard to get hold of your GP or any professionals. And there were long phone calls, waiting. And you know, it's, it was so hard. But at the same time, it was, it was an, an eye opener because I was told that my treatment within 31 days, I'll know the course of my treatment within the NHS, which I found kind of very comforting because I knew what, 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 what I had to battle. And this was because my oncologist was so good that they were telling me step by step of everything I'm going to have. And they broke down everything and the options that uh, doctor has been sharing. So I, I didn't lose my breast. I just had a, a lumpectomy, which then I had a few tests. I didn't need chemotherapy. Thank God I only had uh, radiotherapy. But it was the journeys. It was the uncertainty. It, was, it's, it takes a lot out of you as a person. And you really, really need a community around you. You need people, positive people. So me being from a Black African community, there was a lot of things, you know, people, talk, when you talk about um, religion, people were saying, oh, are you going to have uh, medical intervention? And, and I, to those people, I was saying, well, what happens when you have a toothache? Don't you have medical intervention? What happens when you have a broken leg? Even if you're a Christian, don't you have it, uh, don't you go to, to have it sorted out? So there's a lot of education that we need to, to have as the black community. And some people were, they didn't want me to share publicly because my cancer journey, I think what helped me to heal was it was an open journey. We, we have a, a, every Tuesday in, my, uh, in our charity, we have a coffee morning. So I was talking women through, I said, oh, this, this morning, actually, because most of my, my appointments were on a Tuesday afternoon. So I would say, oh, this afternoon, I'm going to have this done. And they're saying, well, how come you're not bedridden? And I'm saying it's because like, people think you're going to be, that's what I thought myself. But you, you, if, if caught early, it's not something that, it, it's very, very tiring and it takes a lot out of you, but it's not something that will get you bedridden. So out of all the things that you've been saying, doctor, I think positivity for me as a person was key and it helped me to fight it. It was caught very early, but also communication with uh, my medical team was excellent and friends and people around me because my husband and children were, you know, of course heartbroken and you know, very, very scared as a family, but we had friends around, I had people visiting to the point that when um, the district nurse came to remove you know, the home visits that they do after to check on my wound, they actually thought I was a florist because there were so many flowers in my house that they thought I was a florist. And I've had all sorts of cousins because people were coming to see me, all sorts of people coming to see me and support me through this journey. So I really, really, I'm encouraging people. The, the reason I'm here is to encourage people to be open about it because if it's caught early, it is something that can be completely uh, supported. You can be so completely supported to heal and also learn more because cause since I've opened up about it, three women that I know have come out. 
have the, the, the first, the minute I stood up in my church, a woman touched her breast and the very next day she went to hospital. We went through the treatment together. So talking about these things, and let's make it normal. Let's make cancer normal, something normal to talk about because it's really, really helps if you have, make it an open journey. So uh, because I'm a community person and I had my community around me, supporting me, we've since done projects like Answer Cancer, whereby we make cancer a very topic, topic to talk about, the, the religion, the stigma, and knowing that you, we need to put ourselves first because where, where I come from, I come from Uganda and many African countries, we don't have, uh, for example, we, we only respond when we are ill. There's nothing like um, can, you know, cancer checks, mammograms and whatever. I caught it when I was 46, I'm 47 now. So I, I'm, when I, if I go by statistics, I'm on the younger side. But as we were, you know, in the waiting room, I kept chatting to people. There were people who were 19, a 19 year old who had it twice. So it, it's, it's, it doesn't fear no one. So these are conversations that we need to have. So thank you, Khan, for holding this. So at the moment we have, uh, in our space, we've created a cancer hub, whereby we just we talk to people about all sorts of cancer. We've even had a man who's had breast cancer and he, he's, he talks about cancer um, and what is, what is done and the recovery and the process. And also the treatments that doctors talked about, there is treatment, it's, it carries on, it carries on. So the only thing that I would say that was a negative is because of our color, when, when I went for the radio, you know, the, the, the markings, they had to do them almost every day. They had to kind of, and I'm thinking, come on, you've seen so many black breasts that surely at this moment, they should be something for, permanently for us with dark skinned breasts. But it's so, the, the, the support was so white. It was all about, you know, you know, we need to change that. So I think this is a discussion that we need to check and see what suits us, even the wigs. Even when I was told, oh, you might have a, a complete mastectomy, this is what you will need. The only white breasts and blonde wigs that were on offer. And I don't know, that's something that we need to look out for. So I just want to say that um, it's an opportunity that I use now to talk about everywhere I go, because I don't know whose life, you, like, whose life I might save just by coming out. And the other thing is that uh, I listened to the oncologist and everything but nobody made sense to me except my peers who'd been through cancer. When they spoke, I listened. So I've been a community leader for, for 19 years, but I didn't understand until I had cancer what peer mentoring means. So if you're around people who've gone through something, they are the best people to talk to. Because, I mean, the diagnosis, if I read it out to you, it's a lot of high negative, high this. It's, it, and I didn't do very well in biology. So I didn't find it easy to understand. I only wanted them to tell me, this is where we're up to, this is what we are taking out, this is what you're taking. So just that language. And I often think of people who, I think of myself as articulate, I speak English, but all about my sisters and brothers who can't speak English. People who, who is, whose English is not the first language, who don't even understand a word. So for me, platforms like this, I just want to be part of everything that supports people to understand their issues. I'll just stop there because I'm very interested in the questions that uh, people want to ask. Uh, Thank you so them. much, Rose. That was um, amazing. That was fantastic. Um, I think sometimes things are just happenstance. So you may know I've been presenting um, the Khan Half Hour for about two years and I've had a break for six months. Um, and that was because I also had breast cancer. Um, so. I wasn't supposed to present today. The person who was presenting, there was something wrong with her internet. So I, I decided to step in instead. And mine was from screening. So one of the questions I've got here is that the screening you say starts at 50 jajet, but um, the, what you presented was that on average, black women get it at about 50. So are there any plans to reduce the, the, the age of, of screening? So there, so there are. So in some, they, they did trial it. So dropping it down to 47. Um, in my unit, if you present symptomatically, uh, you will get a mammogram from the age of 40. 
Um, there are other things that are looking at. So things that can put you in a category for enhanced screening, for instance. So that's why it's really important to know your family history. Um, so if you have a fam family history that suggests that you're at slightly higher risk, there are different levels of screening that you can have and they, they can start um, from the age of 30. So that's why I always say it's really, really good to know your family history and we can get, send out family history questionnaires, which people can fill in. Uh, and if they uh, meet those criteria, then they can have enhanced screening. And screening can be in different ways. It's not necessarily just mammograms. They can also do it by MRI. They've got studies going on looking at artificial intelligence, looking at like breast density and things to be able to give you a risk score. So they are moving towards looking at this. They are looking at the screening program uh, and ways in which they can capture more people early. Um, can I just say, by the way, Rose, that was that was phenomenal. Like that, this is exactly what needs to happen. You know, th this discussion and this, like I've been through. This is my lived experience. These are the negatives. These are the positives, and there was a lot of positives there. And the negatives that you've mentioned, you are not alone. Lots of people have said this about wigs, about prosthetics, about lymphedema sleeves, the radiotherapy marking. That was a new one, actually. So I will take that away. Um, and there are things that are happening. So um, one of um, the, the women that helps me with my breast cancer awareness um, conference, she's a breast cancer nurse at the Royal Marsden. And one of her projects is looking specifically at um, prosthetics and making sure that they're available in skin appropriate, you know, tones that are appropriate to skin, um, you know, of the wearer. So, you know, we're not all one shade, we're not all this uh, pink. So, you know, there needs to be prosthetics which match other people's skin tones. Um, another colleague in Nottingham, and again, and someone else who's gone through, she used to actually be a radiographer, so she used to do the mammograms. Um, she got breast cancer. Um, and one of the issues, as you've mentioned, was the wigs. So they've started like a, a whole programme in Nottingham where you can get ethnic appropriate wigs. Um, so, you know, talking about these things, bringing them out, saying these are not acceptable. It's not acceptable. We're all taxpayers. It's not acceptable. You know, if we've got to say that these are the issues. If we don't talk about it, if we don't raise it, then it'll just be business as usual. But if we actually go, well, look, these are, these are, these are not difficult things. It is not difficult to have a wig that's appropriate. It's, it's not. So, you know, these are, these are things that we, we should be able to sort out for our community. Absolutely. And I must say that when I got my diagnosis, people said, well, you, you, you're healthy, you run, you eat healthily, you present the health hour every week. And, and yet it happened to you as well. And it encouraged lots of people to go to screening. So where I live in Stockport, the screening starts at 47. Um, it's a, a bit early. I, I don't know why. It's just uh, fortuitous that they, they, they do it there. But um, it meant that there were lots of women I came across who said, I, I haven't done my screening, I'm, I'm going to go. So it's really important to go and have your screening done um, because that's how I find out. I didn't find out from a lump, I found out from screening. And before that, I was completely healthy. I still didn't feel a lump afterwards. And despite the fact that, unlike you, Rose, my biology is a bit better, but still it was very, very scary for me as well because once you hear the diagnosis, you do think the worst. Um, and even though I knew that the um, survival rates were a lot better now, I still felt really worried that um, it wasn't gonna be a good outcome. So thanks for coming today, Jajet. So the, there are lots of questions, but I can see two people with their hands up. So what I'm gonna do, if you can keep it short, because what I'd like to do is to get to the questions so that everybody, and some people have sent me some um, personal questions as well, because I think, they would prefer for me to read it out on their behalf. So I'll just go to Sharon first. Yes, um, hello, thank you for, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, thank you for making me speak today. Um, I would, I really wanted to tell, I will make it short, but I really wanted to tell my story. It will be short, but it is re extremely relevant. I pray every day that I get the opportunity to be able to tell my story about what happened to me because I am a, a Catholic and I believe I've had breast cancer and I've had uterine cancer and I believe God gave it to me, in, not God gave it to me, I've got this so that I can help to spread the word because I think by things like this, if we speak more about it, we can, we, we, we can help others. So let me just tell you one thing, I got cancer, breast cancer in 2014. I got stage three cancer in 2014. Let people know that because I'm still here and I'm healthy after getting it in 2014. I got a, I got a lump when I, it was only 
one was I got a lump and I found it really early but the mammogram didn't didn't detect it they told me everything was fine in a year's time it turned into stage three when I went back I want people to know that because the, the mammogram if you feel a lump and a mammogram doesn't show it you still have to tell them that this is the, that this is real I didn't I believed that there was nothing after a year it became stage three and lymph nodes I got all my lymph nodes uh, removed I had chemotherapy I had a lumpectomy I had everything done and I was in despair I went to a really really bad place I, I researched everything, you know, I know everything and researched all of this. I got to a very, very bad place, but I came out of that and I, and, and, and I am here to be able to tell the tale. One thing I'll say about radiotherapy, it can also, even New York breast cancer, it can make black people's skin get darker. And they didn't know that and they didn't believe me. And I said, look, I've researched in Canada, this is the case. There are lots of stories I can tell, tell, tell about this. Now, a year in, in, in lockdown, I, and I, I, I will just say I, I got symptom. I got two little drops of blood Thought it was nothing. I went, can you believe it? I got uterine cancer in 2020, but I, it was very early this time, got caught, caught early. So I always said I want to be a, I, I, and, and also let me add to it. I've lost a first cousin, two first cousins. One was practically my sister to breast cancer and to uterine cancer. And both of them hid it from the family. No one knew. I told other black people about it. I thought it was just a, Carib a Dominican thing or just a Caribbean thing. No, my, my, my Nigerian Ghanaian friend said similar. My Middle Eastern friend said similar. My, my Asian friend said similar. So I'm very open about it. I talk about cancer all the time and I really do want to talk it and I want to be a spokeswoman to really get people to exactly what Rose said, speak about it because look at me, stage three and look at, and, and look at me now. So I really want us to be more open and talk about it. And I would really like, Georgette, if you could come to my bank with our women in the bank and our, um, um, our networks, I work at the Bank of England, if you could come and speak to us um, I've actually prayed to God that I got the opportunity for this sort of thing. So when this came up, I was just so pleased because I think, I think that together we can save so, so many lives because too many black women and my so many cousins, these are my first cousins, I've got second cousins, died, same story in their 50s, leaving their kids behind, so many. And I'm actually on a uh, genetic research for uh, at um, Great Ormond Street, even though I, ordinarily, I wouldn't actually be part of it, even though I've had so many, but in speaking to her, because my uterine cancer was so unusual, she's actually put me on that. So I feel that I really do want to do something. So if you can contact, if I can get your details to contact you and we can do something, I am someone who's willing to speak and speak and speak until I can't speak anymore to try yeah. and save the lives <laughs> of our sisters. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that's 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 amazing. What, what I'm going to do, I can see that and um, both the couple of other hands up, but I'm going to just give the opportunity to people who've had asked questions very early on. So, um, Jajet, these are a couple of questions for you. One's a very easy one. Do you do private patients? Someone's asked. I do. <laughs> I do. I do. That's so short, I, short and simple. I've got practices in Nottingham and London, yes. Okay. Um, somebody's asked a question here and, and said that when they, they went for their. Um, they're currently going through the journey now and they've been told about this, the reconstruction and they've been told that they can have it from different places and they're really confused about all the different options um, because they've been told it, they can take it from the, I think the picture you showed and also from their tummy and they don't know which is better. So the reconstruction element of things is, is quite complicated and is very much patient directed which is another um which can be quite daunting actually because these are big decisions which essentially we say look this is not your cancer treatment per se so this can be very much driven by you breast cancer now actually has a really nice reconstruction booklet and in it and you can just go on the website and i think you can either download it or your breast care nurse should be able to get you a copy and in it it's got like all the different types of operations and all the different types of reconstructive options it is very important if you are still confused after the consultation, because, again, one of the issues is we don't have a lot of time to sit down and really go through things. And so it might be that you need to have more than one consultation. So a lot of people should have a named breast care nurse. And I always say, well, look, if you come away from something and you feel that I don't 
I, I don't think I really got any of that. And it was a real issue through COVID, actually, because people weren't allowed to even bring somebody along with them who could at least try and take in some of that information and share back later. Then just ask for another ask for another consultation. Because we are we have these all these targets for breast cancer, once you are diagnosed, you move through the system really very quickly, actually. You know, we're operating on people within four weeks of their diagnosis. So it's actually quite quick the way things move through through sometimes and you're sometimes caught up in this whirlwind and it's very difficult to be able to just pause things for a moment and go look I'm I'm really not following what's happening with these steps what I, I know I'm harping on a lot about my conference but last year what I, I did is I, I actually got a communication coach to come and speak because it's really because these consultations can be quite short it's about methods to be able to extract the information you need as well as to be able to ask the questions because I think sometimes people are afraid to ask the questions and then sometimes I'll ask the questions but then the answer we give them is not something that they really understand but they don't want to be wasting you know the doctor's time so I think it is very important that patients really understand Understand. And I write my letters to the patient, not to the GP. So the information I try to give is in a way that I want them to digest it. And I always say, if you don't, come back and see me and we'll go through it. That's great. There, there are lots of people on this on, on, on today who don't live in the UK and so can't access screening. And there, there, there's someone here from Nigeria who says that her sister died of um, breast cancer 11 years ago. She was 38. Um, and now you, you've talked about relatives. Should she have screening early? What, what should she do? So she needs to know what her family history is. And, you know, w- one of the reasons I went into this, like I said, is I, I have got a friend whose husband's sister, four sisters have had, and the mother now. And they have been genetic tested. And all those genes that listed, it's, it's not positive in family. But you're not going to tell me that they don't have a strong family history and therefore need enhanced screening, right? So it is talking within the family, is there, who else has had breast cancer? Who else has had ovarian cancer? And if, when you put that all together, you're like, yeah, this is quite strong. You know, it, it's, you either have to be very good at doing your own breast exams, or you need to push to get your mammograms done and different places do different you know like in America you know they'll recommend that you have it like you know every two minutes probably because they get paid every time but you know we do it every three years I know a lot of places do it annually um but it, it is about being able to examine yourself and knowing where to go to have it investigated and that's not always easy when you don't live in a system in which it's very structured yeah I think access to, to good health care is, is important and we're very fortunate because I know from personal experience that when I shared my diagnosis with, with some people, they said to me that, you know, even though I'm a doctor, that have I considered alternatives um, to surgery and to whatever therapy I was going to have. Um, so that's, that's just, uh, and, and I hadn't actually, because I felt that going to hospital was, was the best thing for me to do. But there's a question here about can cancer be reversed by a plant based diet? So I'm a scientist, so I go, uh, with, you know, which they, they, I, as a scientist, I always go, well, look, we need to research things. Right. So if we can do a trial and a study in which we can look at that and we can see the outcomes and we can go, OK, there is an evidence base, um, then that's one thing. People have a lot of beliefs about how things should be managed, and that's OK. But what I always say is there is nothing wrong with doing multiple things, right? So there is nothing wrong with going along and having doing all the advice that's given to you by the healthcare professional at the hospital. So engaging with the surgery, engaging with the, you know, the chemotherapy, the radiotherapy, the tablet therapies. But you can look at your diet. And we know that having, you know, we've, we've already said that, you know, being within, you know, a good, you know, a normal weight, having a, a well-balanced diet. These are positives for health in general. So I, you know, I always say that, you know, there is no reason why you have to choose one or the other. You know, some things can happen in parallel, but you do need to talk. So if you are going to do things in parallel, you need to talk to your healthcare professional as well so that they're aware of what is happening and they can tell you if there's going to be any interactions um, in that way. One of the things that makes my heart sink is when I, I give a diagnosis to a patient and then they you, you, you tell them the treatment option and then they go, well, I'm going to go away and try something else. And they disappear six months, nine months, 12 months, and then they come back with worse disease than when you met them. Um, that is, you know, that is quite heartbreaking because you went from a situation in which, you know, 90 something percent cure to needing lifelong treatment, you know, or, you know, or even, you know, 
you know, it, you know, they're going to succumb to that disease where when they wouldn't have done if they had just engaged with the treatment protocol the year before. It's heartbreaking. That it is heartbreaking. Yeah, and uh, the 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 power of prayer. I say yes. I wanted. I told everybody because I wanted to have as much prayer as I could for me, but as an adjunct with the hospital therapy as well. I needed both. Because I always say, look, you know, God gave us the skills, right? We didn't just, you know, God gave us the skills to do these things, to do the operations, to come up with the drugs. Why is this not things that God has given us to use? This yeah. is my argument. You're speaking to the converted. <laughs> so I'm hoping we can convert a few more people yeah. here as well. Um, I'm going to come to Angela and then to um, Pastor Chinny because um, you've got your hands up. If you can keep it really short, because I still have some more questions on the chat that I'd like to put to you, Jajet. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for allowing me to um, just to share. I I'd love to share my testimony, but I know there's no time. But um, my question is to George, is it Georgia? Yeah. And you talked, you talked about the reconstruction. Um, I wanted it, but I had cancer like during the treatment sorry during the lockdown and everything seemed to fizzle out and in the end they gave me these these things you wear in your bra and I struggle with them no it doesn't look the same it's not the same as me and it's it smells and it and it itches and then after that because I'm I'm out and doing stuff during the days and I'm at uni it scratches and things like that and I asked contacted the nurse because during COVID they says you can come back and I have gone back to them and then you don't hear nothing I know you talked about a booklet and the different types and that's okay but where can I get somebody to engage with me to to actually go back on that road I just feel like yeah. you need you need an appointment to see somebody about your reconstruction so that's say so that plastic they can refer you to plastic surgery so plastic surgeons do all types of reconstruction so using your own tissue and implant based breast surgeons tend to do um just implant based type reconstructions so I think if you want someone who can talk you through the totality of what's available to you then yeah. refer to a plastic surgeon but it might be so the thing is that there are more breast units than there are plastic surgery units so you'll so you may get a, an appointment a lot easier at your breast unit and they can talk you through things mm -hmm. and then if necessary they then may refer you up to plastic so I think you've got to get back on them and go, look, I want an appointment to talk about reconstruction. Now, the honest truth is, is how quickly will you get that reconstruction? Well, yeah. not very quick at all. In my unit, it can take up to two years, actually, for some of the tissue based reconstructive options. But the fact of the matter is, if you're not on the waiting list, it's going to take you a lot longer than two years. So, okay. you know, the GP, you can get onto the GP, you can get onto your breast care nurse. I want referring to discuss reconstruction yeah. because women are entitled to have reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank if, you if for that. So not all women will be eligible in terms of what's available in, you know, mm -hmm. what, have that consultation, but at the very least you should have a consultation where they tell you that, that you know, yeah. these are the options for you. Yeah, I just feel that through because of COVID, um, a lot of things have just slipped through the net. It has. And now, you, and now that I'm, yeah, now that I'm trying to say, excuse me, you said I could have this. I'm not getting nowhere with it. So I'm really grateful. Thank you for the this. Breast care nurse, GP. And if that doesn't work, write to PALS. That's, the, you know, the system that they have at the hospital for complaints. Write to PALS and say, I've been trying to get this done. It's not being done. Write to PALS. And hopefully they will help facilitate that for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Pastor Chinny, is it? Pastor Chinny? Yes, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And I appreciate the presenter and all that have shared their experiences today. I'm so, so, so proud of you all. I'm interested in the topic, one, I know that cancer has phases, the screening, the diagnosis, the treatment, and the survivorship support phase. And my focus is on the survivorship support phase. I've been doing this PhD, God knows how long, but since 2014, and I've been to three universities looking for what happens to black cancer survivors when they finished hospital treatment and appointment. 
because it's not enough for Macmillan and other cancer charities publishing that, oh, black, uh, black cancer survivors are less likely to access their support. So why don't they access that support? Nobody has cared to find out. And the, things, um, the ladies that shared this morning their experiences is exactly what I have found out because I've been able to, and I'm sponsoring myself for this 100 years of doing PhD. I didn't want to give up because it's for my people and those around me were just dying anyhow. And I wanted to really, really find out. It's not about having a PhD, it's about what support have we got for these black people. And you can imagine when you go, they give you that white skin breast, how it looks like and stuff like that. So I've been finding this thing, but why I say let me speak is because of two things. One, I had a problem recruiting. I managed to do the first phase in the community through groups, black groups. But the one I wanted to recruit from the hospital, they gave out 70 packs to our black people. For six months, none of them agreed to have interview. So the problem is when we don't come out to say what we want and what is our uh, concern, they can't design or structure anything that's going to fit our skin and fit our uh, psychological state and emotion. They will always do what research has told them, like the presenter said. So I'm asking, please, if there is any how we can broadcast this more so that they can access research studies that, that are put in place to support us. And again, the second thing I said, I, I was going to say two things. The second thing is I've shared my find, few of my findings with our MP. And she said, when I finish my baba, when I finish everything, that she will package it and present it in the parliament so that it can, it can affect health policies with specific focus on black cancer survivors. That's a promise. But then I would suggest that if we on this platform can come together with the same papers and the same focus and form something that when the time comes, we can speak with one voice so that they can actually look at um, having, from my study, if they can put a um, support group that brings in religious aspects of singing, praying, dancing, you know, reading Bible, I'm sure they will ac uh, access such support. But when they go there, it's just to sit down and drink tea or do one thing or the other that is not their interest. They might not be there. That's um, my concern this morning. How can we move this thing forward I, for our I, people I, to hear? Thank, thank you. I think, Pastor Chini. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think those are actually quite um, relevant, two relevant points, actually. So I did mention that engagement in clinical trials. So, you know, I'm of the belief that so few black women, relatively speaking, get breast cancer that any single one that comes through our door, we should be grabbing them and putting them into some kind of trial because, you know, it, it, that's there aren't enough numbers. And you're absolutely correct. Like right now, I'm running a, a research pro project where we're trying to look at things around beliefs um, and about knowledge uh, around breast health. And, and it's been a real struggle. And I was at a um, meeting in London on Wednesday for Black Women Rising, and they have a hundred woman survey where they look again, black women and looked at their experiences. And she told she said it took over six months to get those 100 women signed up for it. So I think as well, we have to we've also got to open ourselves up to participating in things and to talking about our experiences. And it's difficult. I mean, I, you know, I speak to, I've heard a lot of breast cancer survivors are speaking and every time they have to like relive the experiences, et cetera, it can be actually quite triggering for them. And it can, it, it can um, take a lot out of them emotionally to be able to share those stories. Um, but I think that actually, if more people do it, then it means that the burden doesn't land on the few that have to sort of speak at all these different events. You know, it just doesn't land on a few. It's like a collective um, sharing of that responsibility. And I think it, you are absolutely correct. If we don't have information, data, uh, voices, it's very, very difficult to, to get things to change. But it does involve a lot of personal sacrifice for those that are at the the front of it and, and pushing those agendas forward. Um, but I think I think you're spot, spot on. We we have to look at ourselves as well. I mean, you say, well, look, you know, you know, this is a problem which is specific to us. How are we involved in the solution? I must say, when I went when I was going through my treatment, I saw on the on the wall there was um, recruitment for a trial. So I I asked to be put into it, and no one ever contacted me. Yeah. That's very disappointing. Very disappointing. And then with all you're going through, you just think, well, if they can't be bothered to 
contact me, then you, you know, you're not going to uh, put yourself out. So there's some more questions. Thank you very much for that, Pastor Chini. That was an um, excellent contribution. Um, um, on that, though, sorry, just before, the, because there is actually a conference called Blacking Cancer. So people that are interested in that, and it's a, like a, it's a more of a research based focused um thing and I, th I think it's week after next actually it's in a couple of weeks time but you know i think the tickets for like you know public or charity work is, is actually free so if people are genuinely interested in like research and you know specifically black people in cancer research that might be a very good conference for for people to to sign up for okay um there's a couple more questions um you mentioned about screening in nigeria so do you know where this is and um, how to get involved? And is it mainly with religious organizations that um, conduct the screening? So I, I don't specifically know about screening programs in Nigeria. I think that it's the sort of thing that you invariably will have to end up paying for privately, I would have thought. Um, so it, it's not something that I can say with any confidence off the top of my head. Um, but the people that have been in contact with me, my understanding is uh, they literally have to do these things privately. So it it really is quite, it, it is difficult. And that in itself is part of the reason why the outcomes are poorer in countries that don't have this, the structure that we have, have here. Thank you. So we're coming to the end now. And um, I always think it's nice for our speakers to reflect and give three take home messages for people who have watched today. So the important things, three important things that you'd like everybody who is watching today to reflect on, and take home. Uh, Rose, do you want to go first? I mean, I've been talking a lot. Rose, do you want to go first? Well, you can go first. I don't know okay. whether Rose is still here. Okay. Um, so examining yourself and screening. Those are, you know, I put those together. So know your own breasts and engage with the screening when the time comes. Um, talking. So let's get really good about talking amongst ourselves and our community, out with the community. Um, and thirdly, you know, being engaged with just general health, I think. So, you know, being good about our diet, about our exercise, about our weight, um, you know, make ourselves generally healthier so that when these challenges come in our way, and I, you know, I expect you're going to do fantastically and go from your diagnosis. Why? Because you're already fit. You're already working out. You're already, you know, I can see that you're already, you know, you know, good weight, et cetera. So being in, you know, getting yourself conditioned, just like, you know, you would in, you know, many things you wouldn't get in a car, which, you know, had the wheels falling off and the door hanging, you know, get yourself fit. So when things come our way, we're in a better position to deal with them. Thank you. So just before I hand over to our um, team, uh, I want to say thank you to everybody who's contributed today, people who've joined in, um, Georgette, especially Georgette and Rose, uh, Sharon, Pastor Chini. Um, thank you so much for contributing. That was that has made our discussion today all the more richer. Um, as you know, Khan, apart from doing these talks, we like to collect feedback. So you might have seen the chat. If you've received the link, please could you give us some feedback because it's really important for us to be able to um, assess our impact on the community and to say to our sponsors and, and, and um, that we're making a difference. Um, and lastly, before I hand over, there was a competition run for five blood and the winners of, um, I want to announce the winners of the five blood pressure monitors that people have been watching. And that's an incentive for you to continue to watch um, every week and to tell your friends about it. So the five winners are, and the Khan team will contact you, uh, um, Iyabo Fashon, Rosie A, Betty Wilson, Julian Luaye and V E Banks. So congratulations to our winners and the Caribbean African Health Network team will be in contact to um, tell you how to collect your blood pressure monitors. Notwithstanding, if you don't have one, please go out and get one because it's another important aspect of looking after yourself. So thanks for joining us today. I think it's been a fantastic session and I'm really pleased that it just happened to be my first session back. So um, I hand over to the CAN team now. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, thanks, um, Dr. Ingazi. It's good to have you back. A massive, massive thanks to Dr. George for this informative session on breast cancer. Um, um, Doctor, thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. Uh, we've learned quite an awful lot uh, from today's session. Thank you to Rose and to Sharon for your lived experiences. Honestly, uh, 
It was quite touching and moving. Thank you for your bravery. Uh, massive, massive thanks again to our wonderful chair, Dr. Ingozi. It's good to have you back again, honestly. Um, you never disappoint. Uh, brilliant uh, way of hosting our health hour uh, session. And a big thank you to all our CATE partners um, and all our, our attendees on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. Okay, so if you have any concerns about this topic, please, our helpline is open. You can always contact us. Um, we have some upcoming exciting events, and please do join us for, uh, please do join our CATE part partners if you live in these areas. Um, the first one is Croydon B BME Forum. Next slide, please. Can we start from the top, please? So from Khan, yeah, Caribbean and African Health Network, Khan. Next slide. Black Health Initiative, BHI. Croydon BME Forum. Next slide, please. Enfield Caribbean Association. The Royal Assembly Redeemed Christian Church of God. and RAFA International Development Agency. Next slide, please. So we are back again next Saturday, same time, same link uh, for our healthy, um, uh, for our health hour session. And the topic is prostate cancer and the guest speaker will be Dr. Hector Goma. Next slide, please. So join us um, this Tuesday uh, from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. And the guest speaker is gonna be Amiez uh, Maduka. And the topic is going to be on winter health and nutrition. Next slide, please. Gala, gala, gala. Our gala night is our prestigious, let me please, see. our prestigious gala night is going to take place at the Hilton, Deansgate, Manchester, on, on 22nd of October uh, 2022. It's, it's going to be massive. Please grab your ticket if you haven't done so. Grab your ticket and visit um, uh, a ticket at theportal.com. Um, dot org dot uk forward slash gala and there's going to be a, a video that will be played by the comms team uh, for further information over to you comms Something we're still waiting for you. Hello there, my name is Gillian Joseph, and I want to tell you about an amazing night that I'm hosting for the Caribbean and African Health Network. They have a vision to end health inequalities for Caribbean and African people and end wider health disparities. <laughs> To that end, they're holding this fundraising awards gala in Manchester at the Hilton on the 22nd of October. You can wine and dine, dance and be entertained. I'll be there. I hope to see you. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us this week, and we hope to see you next week on the Health Hour. Have a lovely weekend and take good care of yourselves. Welcome to our Caribbean and African Targeted Health Improvement Program, CAFIP Health Hour.
Caribbean and African Health Network, CARN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating, and giving space to Black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our Black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members, and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members, such as pharmacists, specialist nurses, and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell, and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences and ask questions to our black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATHIB is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund.